Okay, you guys. Um, so we just need to map out the last little bit of population. So if you don't already have the ozone out, get those out. Remember we talked about um, growth of populations last week, and uh, now we're looking at um, different organisms in their uh, response to one another in what we call population cycles. So some populations undergo regular boom and bust cycles, they're called. Um, boom means that they increase in number, and then bust is a, a dramatic decrease in number, so you drop down. And lynx populations follow this boom and bust cycle of pair populations. The reason why is because lynx, um, their main diet is hair. Um, and so uh, the, the snowshoe hair. And so, um, so therefore, they go up and down uh, with um, the hair population. And then there were a couple of hypotheses to explain the hair's 10 year interval as well. So they both have a 10 year boom and bust cycle, which was what this graph here shows. So at the top is your lynx and the snowshoe hair trying to get the, the away from the links there. And so you can see here this, and when we look at the links, we have a follow a 10 year cycle of this boom and bust. So the boom part is the upward part, and then the bust is going down. If you look at the links, it follows the snowshoe hair. The thing about links is that in their environment, their main source of food is the snowshoe hair. They don't really eat much else in their, in their um, environment. And so therefore, their population goes up and down is a direct result of what the snowshoe hair population is going doing. So the snowshoe population goes up, and so now there's lots of food for the lynx to eat, and you can see here soon after the lynx population goes up. Then as the lynx population goes up, they, they can feed off the snowshoe hair, and the snowshoe hair population drops back down, and the lynx population drops down. And so you get that as a direct result of that. That's called a boom and bust cycle. You see that um, in the lynx because the lynx, their diet is mainly snowshoe hair. The question was, does the snowshoe hair drop down like this? Is it really because of the lynx, or is there other things going on? And so that's where they were talking about what's the... Um, what's the, there were two main hypotheses about what made the snowshoe hair go up and down like this and have this boom and bust cycle. So the first hypothesis was that the hair's population cycle followed the cycle of winter food supply. So when there was a lot of food, the, the hair population went up. When there's not so much food, the hair population goes down. So if that was correct, then the cycle should stop if they gave the food, um, gave unlimited food to the, the hair. So if the food supply is increased, so you give them more food, so you shouldn't see that drop if there's plenty of food. And what they found experimentally, um, when they did this, provided food to the hair population, is the whole population increased in size. So there were more hair in general, but they still saw the, um, up and down the boom and the bust. They can still saw that cycle. It's just that the cycle moved up in the, um, in the graph because there were more individuals, but it still had that. So that proved that it's really not why the hair population goes up and down. It's really not due to the, their food supply. Um, so the second hypothesis, so this data does not support the first hypothesis. So then the second hypothesis, there we go. The second hypothesis is the hair population cycle is driven by pressure from predators. And so that actually that is what they found to be the case. So when they studied that 95%, when we saw that bust, 95% um, of the hairs were killed by predators. And so part of those pre predators were lynx. There are other predators for the snowshoe hair, coyotes, owls, things like that. So, so when we saw that bust of the um, going down of the snowshoe hair, it was in part due to the lynx, but in part due to other predators as well. And so it's um, the second hypothesis. And so looking at the lynx, then the availability of the prey is a major factor influencing the predator population. And that is especially so, as I said, when 
the predator has just one prey, one main type of prey. So when the prey becomes scarce, the predator species begin to prey on one another, which causes the predator to actually collapse even more. So imagine this, so the lynx, like when the snowshoe hare population goes down, and for that lynx, that's the majority of its food is the snowshoe hare. So now you have all these lynx and no snowshoe hare to eat off of. And so not only do they, they're, they're hungry, so then they actually turn on one another and they start to prey on one another, which then further makes the, the predator population go down. And the last part of populations is not with the animals, but our role in, um, on this earth. So uh, we, we're, we have a population on the earth of humans. We're no longer growing exponentially, but we still are growing um, as a whole at a very fast rate um, globally. So as we talked about with exponential growth, no population can grow eventually. Humans are no exception. Do you think that there's a carrying capacity for us on the earth? Yes, absolutely. We're not quite sure what that is, um, but there is uh, there's gonna there's a point where there's you know um, space and resources and so on will most likely become limited. Um, the human population, in terms of growth over time, started out very slowly. So until about 1650, and then began to grow exponentially. And so you can see over. A long time here that um, we didn't grow for very long and then we get exponential here and because you know uh, and so it almost looks because of the, the way that they put the um, numbers on the x-axis here uh, it's almost a straight line here so so <coughs> we've grown in recent years and so globally we're now more than 7 billion people overall the rate has slowed on earth but we have different um, pockets or different populations. If we talk about the Earth as a whole, we have one human population, but we really have different populations in different countries. And so, um, so some countries, our rate of growth is much faster um, in certain areas of the world. In other areas of the world, the rate of growth is much sl slower, but we're looking at globally. So all of those countries put, put together. So, um, though the global population overall is still growing, we have begun to slow as a whole, as a global population. So we, there is some kind of carrying capacity, um, uh, but how many humans can? Biosphere, bio means living, um, sphere is referring to the earth, so it's the um, parts of the earth that contain living organisms. How many? can we support? Um, we're just over 7 billion now. By 2050, they predict um, over 10 and a half billion. Um, that's a lot more people. And <laughs> so in estimating the carrying capacity, uh, it's uncertain. People don't agree. Um, they try to get some estimates based upon, remember the, the calculations with the logistic growth model? and looking at our current growth rate and trying to extrapolate it into the future. Look at habitable land. Um, this is land that we can actually live on. Um, on the earth, um, there, there is a lot of land um, uh, that we can't live on, like um, Rocky Mountains and things like that. So um, in the middle of the desert. All right, so there's a lot of in, um, uh, land that we cannot live on and food availability. So. So being, that's called arable land, where we can actually have land to grow um, food on and so on. And so this is a big deal, um, not only like for habitable land, um, people have tried to, to, to um, uh, kind of solve this by building up. So that's the hence the cities and so on. People, you can fit more people in a certain area by um, you know, high rises and so on and so people. Um, live on less um, food availability though you definitely need land to supply food for people and so so the whole food chain um, starts with vegetation and you need vegetation to grow 
um, and, and so on. And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit in the next chapter. We're going to actually talk about food chains and stuff in the next chapter. But in feeding humans, um, as we get more and more humans, or feeding anything, basically, um, why do we eat to get energy, right? And so, so when you have plants as the base of your food chain, plants are the ones that take the energy from the sun and directly convert it into glucose, so they convert that energy. But then when you have like an herbivore, like a cow, eat the grass, so they're eating the grass and grazing and so on, and so they get energy from the um, grass and from the vegetation. But when we eat the cow, do we get all, all the energy that was originally in the grass from the cow? No, because what does the cow do with some of the energy? It uses it to live. It only stores some of it. And so what happens is, as we eat farther up the food chain, you need more and more land and you get less and less energy. It's actually more energy efficient to feed people with a vegetarian lifestyle, all right? Um, because you can, per square mile, you can get more energy um, out of it to feed, feed people. So we'll look at that a little bit in the next chapter. Um, and so, <clears throat> realistically, um, there are limits on human population size based upon the space and the resources and so on. This is what we call an ecological footprint. Um, this is the amount of land. That land means not only where you live, how much land that do you need to grow food that you're going to, uh, to eat, um, uh, how much water uh, and so on, how much land do you need for your natural resources, so when you consume natural gas, if you're feeding your home with natural gas and so on. Uh, ecological footprint is the amount of space, water, and land that would you a uh, country needs to support the average citizen in that particular country. Is the ecological footprint for every country the same, do you think? No, absolutely not. Here in the United States, we're pretty high, all right, in terms of that. Uh, <coughs> so it's a measure of how close we are to the carrying capacity of Earth. And I'll make that connection here in just a second. So countries vary greatly in the footprint size and its capacity. And one way to, to measure ecological footprint is looking at energy use. This is not the only thing, but it's, it's one thing we can look at. Can I go too fast? Actually, before I go to the next one, um, probably I, th I think after the AP test, so I'll one day we'll, I'll take you and we'll use the, um, uh, either the Chromebooks or the laptops. But there's a couple of things online that's kind of really cool where they ask you some questions about your lifestyle, things that you use, how long, much you drive, you know, gasoline, natural resources, about your house that you live in, how big it is, different things. Different things about your lifestyle. And it's interesting that at the end, um, it tells you, it gives you um, uh, uh, a thing that says if everybody on the earth lived like you did, all right, and used all the resources that you did, average citizen here in the United States, it'll tell you actually how many earths we need to support everybody. Because for people in the United States, it's more than one earth, all right, if everybody in the world lived like you did. Um, it's pretty startling and it makes you think a little bit. So, um, so we'll do that. It's, it's just interesting. Um, uh, 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 to, to think about, all right? And so so right now, we have not probably reached our carrying capacity, probably because not everybody lives with a high ecological footprint. We have individuals on the earth that have very high ecological footprints, but we also have very developing countries with very low ecological footprints. The concern is not only more people on the earth, but what happens as the developing countries go through what's called, they call it the demographic transition. It's a transition where they become developed and what happens when their footprints start to match our footprints and we're then, and plus we have more people coming into the world and we're gonna have some issues uh, um, with, with resources and so on. So <coughs> this um, energy use between developed and developing nations, if we just look at energy use, this is not including food or anything like that, um, but you can see here, highest energy use, this is the darkest colors. And so you can see that obviously we are very dark and we have some, a lot of countries in Africa that are very low in energy use. But imagine what's gonna happen as, as, as these guys move up and so on, we're gonna, they're, they're gonna, uh, we're gonna 
have some problems there. All right, so our carrying capacity eventually will probably be limited by the food that, amount of food that we can grow, the amount of space that we can um, fit people into, our non-renewable resources. What does that mean? What's an example of a non-renewable resource? Gasoline is an example of a non-renewable. Non-renewable means that once it's used up, it's gone, all right, and we can't really replace it. Now, gasoline is a um, is formed. It's a um, petroleum product. Uh, uh, it's formed by organisms that died millions of years ago, get buried through the heat and pressure, it converts it into um, oil uh, and natural gas and so on. Um, but, and we extract it from the ground and use it. So I guess a, a million years from now it might be renewable, but right now for all, of, for all our, that takes millions of years for them to form. So for our intents and purposes, it's a non-renewable resource because we're not gonna be around. Uh, you and not. People might be. All right, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And so, <coughs> so unlike other organisms, we can play a role in our population um, in terms of making social changes and so on. All right. So that is population. And so a population is a group of organisms that are the same what? Species, right? So, realistically, <laughs> organisms don't live in isolation um, with their own species. And so that's what the next part is, is communities. Communities are a bunch of different species living together. So you can have a forest community, so that live in the birds and all the different species of birds living with all the different deer and the different squirrel and so on and so forth, all living together in one particular area. And notice here it says close enough for potential interaction. So they come into contact with one another. And so, <coughs> so this first section of this is about the different types of interactions organisms can have with one another. So that these are called interspecific interactions. So ecologists call relationships between species and the community interspecific interactions. And there are different examples that we're going to go through each one of these. And just I'll give you examples of them so you, uh, and, and, and everything. But um, here it says symbiosis. And then in parentheses it says parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. Those are three examples of that. So when we get this part of, in our notes, we'll number these guys. And these interactions can affect the survival, both the survival and the reproduction of the organism. And these interactions can be deemed as positive. We use a positive sign, negative, negative sign is um, zero, is neutral or no effect. And so let's look at, you have a chart on yours that I just put it on there for, it's a nice, neat way to compare and contrast all the interactions to kind of give you the big picture. But we're going to go through underneath the chart and look at each one. I'm going to give you some examples of each one. So, interspecific competition. So, notice it's a negative negative interaction when a species compete for a resource in short supply. So, they're competing. Why would this be negative negative? So, that means both species are negatively affected. Can somebody explain why in competition for a resource both species are negatively affected? Anybody? Got one? Okay, so since they're competing, um, uh, this, either one of them cannot take full advantage of the resource, so they're not getting 100% of that resource. Absolutely. Anybody else? I would add to that is when they are competing they're using up energy all right and um, expending energy to compete for that resource which can be thought of as a negative effect 
um, possibly expending energy and actually being harmed in the process too. They could be hurt, all right, in a competition, okay? And so, <coughs> so I'm gonna go through some examples with compet competition. So there's what's called competitive exclusion. When you have really strong competition and there's one clear winner, the loser um, can actually, uh, so it's a local elimination of a competing species where the species is kind of pushed away. States that two species competing for the same limiting resources cannot exist in the same space. They can't coexist because of that, if you have very strong competition. So what they found is species that do have strong competition, either one is excluded, um, and so one has to either uh, go find an, a new area, or sometimes what they'll do is um, they they actually coexist by using the resources differently. And so in comes what's called an ecological niche, which should sound familiar, you probably learned about it bio. You guys ever heard of an ecological niche? No? Some people yes, some people no. Alright, so the sum of a species use of biotic, which is living, so like food and so on, and abiotic resources, so like space or uh, and so on, is called the species ecological niche. Also it can be thought of its ecological role. So if you have Similar species that have similar, let's say, food sources or um, uh, needs can coexist in a community if there are one or more significant di differences in their niches. And so the biotic and abiotic factors that they use within the environment. So there has to at least be one difference. So maybe the example I'm using here um, is with resources. So they do what's called resource partitioning. Differentiation of ecological niches, enabling similar species to coexist in a community. So here's an example with these two different li lizards and where they perch. So this is part of the abiotic part of their, their community, um, but they occupy and perch in different areas. So this one's, as it says here, on fence posts, this one here on shady branches and so on. And so therefore, in this case here, the space, the literal space that they occupy are different, which then allow them to coexist versus if they both needed to want to uh, try to be on the fence post, then it would create competition and maybe exclusion of one um, organism. And so, <laughs> so uh, using different um, parts of the community um, differently. Sometimes uh, the niche that they occupy is affected by another organism. So a species fundamental niche is the one potentially occupied by that species. So this is potentially occupied. A realized niche is the one that is actually occupying. <laughs> so because of competition then, one species may push another species out of um, its full potential niche. So let me give you an example of that with these barnacle species that limits the size of the niche. So here we have two species, mine is color coded, yours is not. Did I go too fast? Yes. You good? Yes. All right, so we have these two barnacle species here. So these, I, yours is not color coded, so these guys are this right here and these guys are this right here. <laughs> this is where they actually live. So the space that there, this is their realized niche. These guys live up here on the shore, kind of away from the water. These guys live nearest the water on the shore and into the water. That's their realized niche. When you find them in their natural environment, that's where you find them. So realized means real, all right? That's their actual niche. Now, what happens is I wondered, well, 
this this one really is its, it's niche here just because it doesn't want to be by the water and this is the part that it actually just needs or is it have to do something with the interaction between these two species so in the experiment what they did is they took these guys all out so they took all of this species out and watched what happened this species now overtook the area so therefore what they found is that the 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 brown guys here, their niche is actually up here because they were excluded from the, 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 uh, this part here from these guys here. So these guys are competition. This one clearly won, all right? And so therefore pushes that one out. And so, so a niche can change based upon the other organisms in the uh, environment. And so, so this was their fundamental niche down below. That's the one that they could occupy if we get rid of these guys here. Oops. Another example of the niche changing in response to another organism is with the spiny mouse and the golden spiny mouse um, shows temporal partitioning. Temporal. This has to do with timing. Temporal partitioning of their niches. So what what happens is interesting. Is one of them changes to allow them to coexist. So when you have the spiny mouse by itself, it's nocturnal and active during the night. When you have the golden spiny mouse by itself, it's nocturnal and active during the night. So they're all both up running around at night, eating and so on and so forth. But in the areas where their niches overlap so that they live in the same area, all right, um, one of them becomes what's called diurnal. The golden spiny mouse becomes diurnal, which means active during the day. So what happens is, is that they both can't coexist if they're both active during the night. They compete for the resources and so on. And, 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 uh, and, and so what happens is the golden spiny mouse actually changes its circadian rhythm. It changes its biological clock so that it's active during the day. So now when they live together with the other mouse, the other mouse can be active during the night, it's active during the day, and they're not in direct competition with one another. All right, and so, <coughs> so that's another way to coexist um, in occupying different areas of the niche. All right, so that's number one, competition. So interaction number two is predation. So it's a positive negative, obviously the, who's, who's the positive part? The predator, right? Prey is definitely negative, all right? So um, we're gonna look at uh, adaptations of predator and prey in terms of helping them to do what they need to do. So predators um, have um, adaptations to help them to hunt or to get their prey. They also have adaptations to help to feed on them. So for instance, large claws would be an adaptation. Um, fangs, uh, poison, uh, to poison their, their prey. All of those are adaptations that predators may have. On the flip side, prey also have adaptations. So prey can have behavioral defenses where they hide and some might burrow. Um, flee, so they have, like, can run fast. Some form herds or schools. Um, Self-defense, being able to you know, fight back. Um, alarm uh, calls, like the vervet monkeys have different alarm calls for um, different predators. So we'll look at a few of these here. Um, animals also have morphological or physiological defenses, and so we'll look at those. Um, and mechanical and chemical defenses, like the porcupines with their quills is a mechanical defense. The chemical defense is um, uh, the chemical that has the odor that skunks emit. Um, let's look at a few of these behavioral defenses. How can forming herds or schools be a, a defense? How can forming herds or schools be a defense mechanism? Okay, then. In 
and what? And the strength of numbers. And the strength of numbers, yes, absolutely. So the size can be intimidating. Um, uh, anybody else? Very good. So, um, so, so I just want to hit on that one. So let's look at, we're going to look at a couple of these other defenses here. So, so this gives you an overview. We're going to look at each one of these here. So here's your porcupine. It's a mechanical defense with its quills. Chemical defense with the skunk um, emitting um, uh, a chemical that doesn't smell good. Um, we're going to look at these guys here. Um, to, uh, as we go on here, we're coloration and hiding and camouflage as well as mimicking other organisms can also be defense mechanisms. So let's look at this. So animals that have chemical defenses, they're really good at chemically defending themselves, often exhibit bright warning coloration. You guys know that, that's like a lot of animals that are brightly colored um, are uh, chemical defenses. This is called aposematic, automatic coloration. And so what happens is the predators, when they, let's say, prey uh, or uh, get the prey, it may make them sick, um, not taste good or whatever, and those that prey is brightly colored and then they learn to stay away from the brightly colored prey because we have a negative reaction to it. Uh, and so <laughs> the poison dart frog is an example of that. So um, there are different species of poison dart frogs. They're all very colorful, um, very pretty, very pretty frogs. They exude a poisonous chemical from their skin. Um, so, so they are definitely um, the one that you want to stay away from. But, um, but they, uh, that's an example of that coloration. On the flip side, some coloration that's called cryptic coloration, you guys know this as camouflage. Um, helps to make the prey difficult to spot. And so it helps the prey to hide. Unlike the aposmatic, where the prey is brightly colored, but they don't really need to hide because then the, the predators know not to eat them because of their, that they're poisonous. The ones, the organisms that show camouflage, generally, they don't necessarily, don't, there's not that, not that relationship of being poisonous, right? Like there is with the, um, and so cryptic coloration, the canyon tree frog. So you can probably see him. You guys see the canyon tree frog in here? Um, here, pointed out for people. Here's his eye. Right, this is other eye right here. This is his face. Here he is right here, kind of this body. So you can probably see him because it's a small picture and you know to look for a tree frog in there. But if you were, if he was, if you were just walking in the wild and there were rocks and, and so on. Um, you probably would never even see him there. All right, so it's very good camouflage to hide um, from um, predators. And um, organisms that do cryptic coloration or camouflage um, sometimes are always camouflaged the same way. Some organisms can change their camouflage. Um, so the snowshoe hair with the links that we just talked about, snowshoe hairs change the color of the fur. They're brown in the summer and uh, to, to blend in with the ground in the summertime and white in the wintertime, so they change their coloration, um, and some organisms do not, all right? So they kind of, their, their environment is the same throughout. Um, sometimes it's not um, camouflage, um, but we might want to, some cases the prey mimics the appearance of another species. So, so it makes itself look like another species and that helps with its survival. So Batesia mimicry, a palatable, that means um, tasty, like it, the organism's not going to uh, uh, spit it out or whatever, not want to eat it, or harmless, so there's nothing wrong with it, the, the predator is not going to get sick for them from them. Mimics an unpalatable, so one that the uh, species that doesn't taste good to the predator or actually is harmful in some way, makes the predator sick or has po is poisonous or so on. So, so there's one that's harmless, kind of looks like the other one and therefore that's beneficial because then the, the predator won't eat the, the one that looks like the harmful one. An example of this is Kind of a neat example here. Um, this is a snake, all right? So this is a green parrot snake. So this is the head of one of the head of the snake. Is this actually is the larva of a moth? A hawk. That's called a hawk moth. And so what it actually
actually does is it enlarges one end of the larva. The enlargement actually looks like the head of a snake, even though it's just the larva of a moth. This is going to turn into a moth and just be, you know, and so on. And so um, it, it itself is harmless and, um, and, and so on, and not poisonous or anything like that, but um, uh, it was not eaten because it looks like a harmful organism. Um, another kind of mimicry is called malarian mimicry, where two or more unpalatable species resemble one another. So they're both not good. Example is these two guys here. Alright. And we have the two insects here. And so these guys look like each other, they mimic each other, but they're both unpalatable. So therefore, um, they're, the, from their, their predators, um, they're, they're not good to eat, they're not tasty, and so on. Why would it be helpful for those guys to look alike? How would it help both of those? Because they're both helpful. An experience with one of them so if it has an experience with this one and it's not a good experience because this one looks like it even though it hasn't eaten one of these guys it won't eat one of these guys because of its experience here and so therefore then it benefits this one and the vice versa if it eats this one it won't eat that one and so they're both helped that way um, by looking alike that way um, predators can also use mimicry. So we just looked at prey, so that was the prey. Predators can use mimicry as well to approach prey. So the example is the mimic octopus. It actually can take on the appearance and movement of other organisms depending on its situation. So, so by, it actually takes its arms and makes itself look in different shapes. And so, so for instance, this one up here says it's mimicking a sea snake. This is not to a, um, to hunt. This is actually um, when it when a predator comes near it, it will mimic so it looks like a sea snake instead of an octopus, and the predator won't want to eat it. And how it does that? It has two arms out here. It buries all the other arms in the sand, so it looks like a snake. It's very smart. Alright, so it looks like a snake. Um, on the flip side, so this is him acting as a prey for, for protection. As a predator, it can move its arms to look like other living organisms. So it can mimic to look like a flounder or a stingray um, and so on so that it can just move so along and say, oh, I'm just harmless. <laughs> and then it attacks, alright, so that they don't think it's um, uh, uh, the, the prey is not um, taken aback right away. It allows them to get closer to actually attack it better. All right, um, next interaction is called herbivory. This is a positive negative interaction. It comes from the word herbivore. So it's when an herbivore eats part of a plant. Or alga, alga is um, the singular for algae. So it could be algae in the water here. So herbivore eats part of the plant. So obviously the herbivore is benefited, the plant um, is not. And so plants, as a result of this interaction, plants have, some plants have evolved some defense mechanisms. So the first one says a mechanical defense mechanism. So can somebody think of a mechanical defense mechanism in a plant? Thorns, like on roses. Poison ivy is uh, chemical, right? So that would be an example of chemical defenses where um, you have an adverse reaction to a chemical it exudes from its leaves, leaves 
and therefore you do not want to touch it um, and uh, and so on and so absolutely so that's one mechanical one chemical defense all right um, now this is where it says symbiosis symbiosis is the blanket overview of the next three beyond that so symbiosis is generally where you have a relationship between at least two organisms that live direct in direct contact with one another so they live closely together this in itself isn't an interaction. The next three are examples of these. So underneath there, notice how it says parasitism. So you might want to put like a number one underneath parasitism. That's, that is one example of symbiosis. All right, so that's the, the first example of symbiosis. So parasitism also is a positive negative interaction where the parasite derives nourishment from its host is harmed in the process. So in this case here, the parasite benefits, it's getting nourishment, often as protection, especially if it goes inside the host. The host is harmed in some way, usually can cause sickness, sometimes can cause death. Parasites that live within the body are called endoparasites. Those are inside, and those means into. Ecto is outside, and so um, they live on the external surface on the outside of the body. But in both cases, they um, harm the host. Many parasites have a complex life cycle involving a number of different types of hosts. Some parasites change the behavior of the host in a way that increases the likelihood that the parasite will be transmitted to the next host. And parasites can significantly significantly affect the survival, reproduction, and density of the host. Um, especially density if they cause the host, some of the host population to die off, if it's gonna become less um, dense as well. So they have a complex life cycle involving a number of hosts. That can mean different types of hosts. So um, the parasite that causes malaria is transmitted through a mosquito. So the mosquito bites a human, but then that parasite now gets into humans. So now we have two different parts of their life cycle inside two different types of organisms. Um, some can, when it says here, their life cycle involves a number of hosts, it can be transmitted from organism to organism in terms of the same species as well. Can anybody think of a change in behavior of the host that would cause an increase in the likelihood that that parasite gets passed on to another organism. When you think of a change in behavior that a parasite might cause to happen. Okay, sneezing, yeah, absolutely. Uh, anybody else? Change in behavior, Not a, think about animals, it doesn't have to be us. Think of a change in behavior that would increase the likelihood that the parasite would be transmitted to another organism instead of staying within the one. Somebody last hour uh, talked about fungus and ants too, so it's just yeah. funny that. So I just was it in a, a school somewhere? No. Okay. So you must have just come across the same thing. It's just funny. All right. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, sometimes they can get infected. That an animal it might change their behavior in terms of becoming more like um, ferocious, like one like bite another animal, which then can cause it to spread through the saliva for another organism as well. All right. <laughs> Two, <laughs> the second example of symbiosis um, is mutualism. So you wanna put example two there. This is under symbiosis where two organisms um, live in close proximity to one another. 
and it benefits both species. And it can be obligate where one species cannot survive without the other, or it can be what we call facultative where they, they're able to survive without each other, but um, they survive better in the presence of one another. And then, yeah, we can go back. So, and looking at this example of mutualism, this is with these um, species of stinging ants and uh, a plant called the acacia tree. So this is mutualism, so they both help each other um, in their interaction. So let's look at what how the stinging ant is helped. So the, the acacia tree has thorns on it that are hollow, and so the stinging ants actually live within these hollow horn, uh, thorns. And they also, um, they have uh, flowers on the acacia tree, they have nectar, and so therefore the ants actually feed off of the nectar of the um, the tree. So the ants are helped a lot in that case. Now this is mutualism, so now the acacia tree has to be helped. And so the acacia tree, here's the tree, notice here that there's an area around it that's all brown because nothing lives there. That's because the little ants kill off anything that tries to grow around its tree. So it snips off and it kills off, any, so anything starts to sprout up, it kills it off. And so therefore nothing is living around that. How does that help the tree? No competition. So the root system, there's it gets all the nutrients and water in the soil. Um, nothing's growing around it, so it's um, it gets the sunlight and so on. Um, and also, these guys are stinging ants. So therefore, anything that tries to approach it, it they get stung by the ants. All right, so the ants will sting um, any uh, like an herbivore or something like that that tries to come and eat the plant. So therefore, they're both benefited in this mutualistic relationship with one another. All right, and then this is example number three underneath symbiosis, commensalism. This one, is this positive neutral interaction? I keep waiting for one day that they're gonna take this away as part of a interaction because of this second bullet. It's hard to document, document because in nature, um, it's hard to say that for sure the other organism isn't harmed or helped. So we might not understand if it's harmed or helped because we're not that organism, but there can be arguments for that. Let me give you an example here. This is a common example with this buffalo and these cattle egrets. The cattle egrets are the birds. And so what happens is, is this buffalo, as it moves through the grass, um, causes um, insects to fly up into the air. The birds eat the insects, all right? So the birds are eating the insects. And so therefore, the cattle egrets are said to be helped because um, they're getting like a smorgasbord of insects as this cattle moves through. And the neutral part is that the, the cat, uh, the, I should say the buffalo, um, is uh, uh, not helped or harmed in this case. That's the argument, hence uh, uh, an example of commensalism. So, um, it's not, it's kind of in a neutral position. Can anybody make an argument for um, a way in which the, the buffalo you think could be affected? What, Roman? Just an effect on the buffalo, because this is an example of commensalism. Commensalism says the other organi organism is neither harmed nor help. So my question to you is, can you think of a way in which the buffalo may be harmed or helped? It doesn't have to be harmed or helped, but one of the... the Okay, so in this case you would say that the buffalo is... No, we're talking about the relationship between the birds and the buffalo. So, so you're saying that the water buffalo, the insects, could bite them, 
carrying diseases, things like that. So would the buffalo be positively or negatively affected by the birds, the cattle egret, eating the insects? They would be positively affected, all right? And so that's an argument there. Um, and so, um, so that's why commensalism, that's an example why commensalism is hard to actually like pinpoint and say for sure it is either harmed or helped and so on and so forth. So that's why there's kind of some arguments about that. All right. And then this is not an example of symbiosis. So we're done with the examples there. With, and so the, just this is a separate type of interaction called facilitation. Positive, positive or neutral positive. Interaction in which one species has positive effects on another species without direct and intimate contact. So for example, the black rush is a plant that makes the soil more hospitable for other plant species. So what does it do? Um, the, the black rush grows in New England in salt marshes. So therefore you have salty water. So what it does, let's, I just want to give you a, a view of what it looks like. What it does when we say it makes it more hospitable, what it does is shades, shades the soil. It shades the soil. What is it gonna to do to the amount of water evaporating out of the soil? Reducing, Reducing the evaporation. which then keeps, keeps the salt concentration in the soil low. Because this is a salt marsh, it has salt water. So could you see if you have salt water and you had a bunch of water evaporate, you're gonna have a higher concentration of salt and therefore the plants might not be able to grow. So this black brush keeps so that the water stays in the soil, dilutes the salt, and so other plants can grow there and thrive and so on. So this is, um, uh, it says without direct and intimate contact, like this plant doesn't really have any direct contact with the other plant, but by the, by it, Putting, um, keeping water in the soil, it helps the other plants that live there as well. All right.